Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Fetching with Adam and Jared. Um, I think I've lost count at this point, and uh, that's okay. Uh, that means we're, I think we're in the double digits at this point. 10. We're, t we're at 10, right. Is that including the uh, 5.33 in the third? No, now we're at 11. 11 hours. Oh, okay. okay. So we, we might be recording another one that we put in between this one and the last one. So uh, yeah, our numbering system that's is, uh, yeah. Yeah, nobody's counting. Um, so in any case, um, uh, welcome back. I'm Jared Taney. I teach Jewish history at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. And I'm Adam Fuller. I teach political science and Jewish studies at Youngstown State University. And here's our guest. Who will introduce Hi, I'm, yeah. <laughs> Should I introduce myself? Go yes, for it. Uh, yeah, I'm Norman Goda. I am the Norman and Irma Brayman Professor of Holocaust Studies at the University of Florida. And I am also the director of the Bud Shorstein Center for Jewish Studies. And I will add that uh, Norm gave me my first job, uh, my uh, second year on the job market, where I finally landed something. And uh, that was the Schusterman postdoctoral teaching fellow um, at Ohio University, a position that I, I held for, for two years with a, a very heavy teaching load. It was 222 that first year. All that was the dean's fault. Yeah, it, it, was, it was a nightmare, um, yeah. writing all those lectures from scratch. I'm still using them today, mind you, so that is a good thing. Uh, so Norm gave me my, my job there. He tried to raise money to create a permanent position, and then sadly, after one year, he disappeared, going to the University of Florida, um, leaving me to my own devices at, at Ohio University, but that's understandable. That's okay. Um, I have benefited from his mentorship immensely um, over the past, uh, Thank you. past 15 years. So um, we're very pleased to have him um, as a guest tonight, given I think he is actually our first Jewish studies professor um, to be on our, our podcast. We've had a handful of professors, but none who is actually in Jewish studies until tonight. And given that uh, the University of Florida has, you know, appears to be one of the more welcoming places uh, for Jews, at least in the Jewish studies program, I mean, there might be issues going on in other and other departments among student activists, but uh, it, there is a ray of light coming out of the Bud Shorstein uh, Jewish Studies uh, uh, Center, if I got the name correctly, um, at the University yes. of Florida. So um, where I'm just going to, you know, we're going to just keep this, you know, wide open and uh, I'll ask Norm just right off the bat, you know, um, what's it like directing Jewish studies there and navigating uh, the political, you know, waters and, uh, and, and you are a member of the Jewish Studies Zionist Network, um, I should. Uh, yes, yes, I, I, I think I was an original, one of the original members, so. Um, we're a very early sure signer and you're one of What number my party card is, but I, yeah, I, I think it was one of the original. I don't think we've sent out cards, but Adam has business cards if he wants, if you want to get a card. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. No. So what's it, what's it, what's it like? Um, uh, you know, uh, it, it's different than a lot of other places. Um, in, in the first place, uh, there are a lot of Jewish students at the University of Florida. Um, you know, no one knows the exact number, but it's, uh, you know, somewhere around 7,000, maybe 8,000 or something like that. Um, and there are two very active uh, Jewish um, Jewish organizations. There's a Hillel that's very active, and there's a Chabad that's very active. Um, on top of that, there are the, the Jewish fraternities, the sororities, um, clubs, you know, and 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 these sorts of things. Um, and and so there's that population um, that you know almost unanimously um, what was dumbstruck. Uh, by what happened on October 7th. And, and, you know, within that Jewish population is a fair number of Israeli uh, students as well. Um, and, and that reaction, um, I, I would say, sort of set the tone for things. Um, Chabad and, and Hillel uh, called a vigil, you know, um, two nights afterwards. There's just sort of a prayer, very solemn, you know, prayer, um, vigil, and I, I, I don't know the final count of it, but there was a, there were a lot of people there, and, and the president spoke. Um, you know, Ben Sass uh, is the president of the University of Florida, the former um, senator from Nebraska, um, and he he talked, and uh, you know, it it was I, I would say just a balm. Uh, for for um, Jewish students and Jewish faculty and everybody else who was there, 
Um, you know, he he didn't miss mince words at all. He he said that uh, there's no excuse for this crime. I mean, I don't remember the exact words, but yeah, you know, there's no excuse for this. It's it's barbaric. It's not resistance. Um, and anyone who argues to the contrary um, is simply morally confused. Um, you know, perhaps by faculty members. Who knows? Um, uh, then there was an incident. Um, yeah, a kid, a kid passed out, and someone yelled nine one one. And it's a measure of how on edge everybody was that that they, you know, just sort of scattered. And and that was the end of the vigil. Uh, the police came in, were were looking around, and that sort of thing. There may be another one at at some. Point. Right, right. Someone passed out, but not because of but, counter. Someone passed out, but not because of counter protesters. You know, coming in and, and chanting. No, 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 no. It's a, yeah, it was, it was crowded and, you know, um, yeah, it, it happens. Um, but then he uh, wrote, I'm, I'm talking about uh, President Sass again, wrote um, a letter uh, to the alumni, which was, um, uh, you know, actually addressed to Jewish alumni, but it must have been some general uh, Gator alumni uh, list in, in which um, he, he said more or less, the same things, but yeah, you know, it was a little smoother. It was a little more ironed out, and and he said uh, very, very clearly um, that that Jewish students here would be protected. Um, we could talk about how um, you know others on different sides of this debate um, found this entire sequence of events to be chilling. That that's the word one uses these days, chilling. Um, on free speech, which, which is another subject entirely, which I'm happy to go into. Um, but, it, you know, the, the atmosphere here, I, I would say from that moment, uh, what was different than you would have seen um, anyplace else. The, the Jewish organizations were immediately in touch uh, with the University of Florida police, which is a, a very big outfit for a very big campus. Um, the Gainesville police, the county sheriff's office, the state troopers. So, you know, we've had, we, you know, the, the sort of leaders of the Jewish organizations and I and the head of our Jewish library, um, our Judaica library, you know, had a big meeting with them. And, you know, we went over, OK, you know, these are the these are these are the people who you call if and if you have a concern, you call this person. And if you're having an event, you know, um, you know, let us know as early as possible, uh, you know, so that we can arrange for security and that sort of thing. And, and of course the local police um, work with Halal and Chabad because, you know, once you're across the street, you're off campus and you're you're into Gainesville. But, um, you, you know, this is part of it, it's just the, the horror of what happened by an absolute critical mass um, of people, um, the president uh, speaking up the way he did. And, and, and I would argue um, a Jewish studies faculty um, that that was, uh, you know, pretty much united um, in this horror as well, uh, you know, kind of led to the atmosphere that we have. I, I would not say it's a perfect atmosphere. There's still a chapter of, uh, despite the governor's efforts, right? I mean, there's still a chapter of Students for Justice in Palestine, and despite the chilling effect <laughs> of the president's um, words, uh, they had a lot of events last week, um, you know, regardless, but but they haven't been violent. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, the police come out for these things, um, you know, you're given a, per a permit for a demonstration that goes to this place, then that place along a prearranged route. Um, the permit is for a certain number of demonstrators, you know, and, and that sort of thing. Because, you know, what the president said was, you're free to say what you want. You know, this is a free speech um, campus. Uh, what you're not free to do, and that includes um, anybody, including um, Jewish students, uh, you know, what you're not free to do, um, you know, is to threaten violence, cause violence, you know, um, and, and these sorts of things. So I, I would not say that free speech has been um, terribly abridged here. Yeah, I, I, I have a, a few excerpts, that I, uh, several paragraphs um, that I want to read from this letter. There's just three sure. short ones here that I want to highlight. Um, this is the one to the alumni. Sorry? 
This is the one to the alumni. Yeah, the alumni, the one you, the one you just emailed me um, a few minutes ago. Um, and I want to come back to the free speech question because there's a, there's mm -hmm. this line in free speech that well let me, let me read this first and then we'll come back to this. Um, I will not tiptoe around this simple fact. What Hamas did is evil, and there is no defense for terrorism. This shouldn't be hard. Sadly, too many people in elite academia have been so weakened by their moral confusion that when they see videos of raped women, hear of a beheaded baby, or learn of a grandmother murdered in her home, the first reaction of some is to, quote, provide context and try to blame the raped woman, beheaded baby, or the murdered grandmother. In other grotesque cases, they express simple support for terrorists. This thinking isn't just wrong, it's sickening, it's dehumanizing, it is beneath people called uh, to educate our next generation of Americans. I'm thankful to say I haven't seen examples of that here at UF, either from our faculty or our student body. And he does have something here about uh, you know free speech um, where uh, he says that he protects it in conjunction with, you know, helping and protecting Jewish students. But I also want to be clear about this. We will protect our Jewish students from violence. If anti-Israel protests come, we will absolutely be ready to act if anyone dares to escalate beyond peaceful protest. Speech is protected. Violence and vandalism um, are not. All right, and there's a great line up in the previous paragraph. Our constitution protects the rights of people to make abject idiots of themselves. So this is really, you know, <laughs> A fully committed, full throttle, you know, I'm on your side and we will protect you. This is the and, model statement from a university administration. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's definitely the best that I've read. And, uh, you know, compared to some of the other ones, there have been some good ones from administrators, um, far more than from Jewish studies programs. But this is really definitely uh, the best um, of the ones that I've read. Um, I want to come back to something about statements soon, but just to get back to what you said before about free speech being protected. Um, first of all, they have crossed the line into what I will say is violence um, at some universities. I saw footage from Cornell last night of, uh, of mm -hmm. students locking Jews in. What, what was the place, Adam? Do you remember what the where they were locked in? Uh, in I the think, library. Are you, they're thinking of Cooper Union. Okay. Jews were locked into the library with the barricade. Yeah, but there was an event at Cornell that got out of hand as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was the this was the second such incident. I forget what school the first one was at, but this one was at Cornell, and they were chanting "Allahu Akbar." I mean, if people are trying to you know make this you know separate from Islam and not impugn Islam, they're not doing a very good job at it. Um, you know, I mean, it's they're not chanting Palestinian slogans at this point. You know, they're bringing their religion into it. But in terms of in terms of you know mm -hmm. speech you know, and uh, free speech. If, you know, Palestinian activists stand outside a Hillel building and start chanting, Palestine will be free from the river to the sea, or there is only uh, one solution, intifada and revolution, um, is that a threat of violence? Well, they're on private property and they can be removed. So, um, you know, that's, that's not university property. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> in that particular case um you know i i don't think it has to be violence or not you know if you're blocking the entrance way and that sort of thing then you're blocking access and you're breaking the law and you can be removed um in the larger sense uh there was a law professor um today who i i think wrote um an interesting column um in in the uh university uh the independent university newspaper and it wasn't really about um uh ben sass it was more about ron DeSantis, who who ordered uh, the uh the chancellor of the university of florida system to deactivate uh students for justice and palestine chapters um on florida campuses there, there's one at the university of florida i think the other one might be at university of south florida but i'm i'm not terribly sure and the rationale was the toolkit mm -hmm. um i don't know if you saw the the infamous toolkit that was sent out by national uh, students for Justice in Palestine right after the October 7th attacks. And there was a line in there, uh, aside from every other line that is, you know, completely abhorrent and, and grotesque. I mean, there was one line in there toward the end telling the 200 or so um, chapters, uh, you are, I forget the exact words, but you are um, part 
uh, of the resistance. You're not, you know, affiliated with the resistance. You are a part of the resistance. Um, and so the the legal reasoning in the governor's office um, was that uh, these chapters were actually, a, a, you know, supporting um, terror. And it's against Florida statute. I mean, this is, is a legal issue having to do with laws in the state of Florida that you cannot support um, terrorist organizations unless you want to be arrested for committing a felony. Now, the, the law professor in question asked that very question. Um, is is speech, um, you know, supporting, you know, providing material support um, to a terror organization. And I think that that might be wrong, but I think the statute refers to material support. Um, and, and she didn't say yes and she didn't say no, um, but she certainly said it, it's quite debatable, um, you know, and that this is the type of thing that, you know, would certainly be adjudicated. But she seemed to say, um, she seemed to think at the end of the article that maybe this went um, a bridge too far, because at, at what point does um, protest become material support? If it becomes violence mm -hmm. um, and terror itself, then certainly it does. But if it does not, um, then then there's something to argue about. The, 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 the happened, more interesting, oh, sorry, go the on. The same thing happened at the University of Louisville a few years ago with the KKK. And I guess the university found that there's nothing they could do to shut down their student chapter of the KKK. Uh, and so if, if, if uh, yeah. KKK, which is labeled a domestic terror organization, uh, can't be shut, a student mm -hmm. chapter that can't be shut down on the basis of their speech, what becomes that bridge too far for an organization like SJP? But it's, it's their very moniker. I mean, if they're using their, uh, their name, Right, they're sort of uh, inscribing themselves, or they're saying that we. Yeah, but SJP National though does not actually. No, no, I'm talking about the KKK here. I'm talking about the KKK. Uh, right. right. And that, that I mean, that seems a lot more clear cut, right? If you're going to use the name of a group that is considered, uh, you know, by law a terrorist organization. But, but even that couldn't shut it down. So what hope would there be for? Yeah. yeah no, I, I see. I see your point. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. That's, that's disturbing. Yeah, I have a feeling the SJP one's going to get struck down in the end. I don't expect that to uh, to to last. It, in, in a sense, though, Jared, um, besides the legal debate over um, over free speech itself, um, there, there's also this very interesting debate that you could only find um, at, at a university over the issue of uh, a chilly atmosphere, right? Or creating uh, or, or, or chilling um, the idea of free speech. And the, 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 um, the, uh, the, um, the uh, sorry, NPR, sorry, the NPR um, affiliate here, um, WUFT actually did a report um, on, on the degree to which uh, the president's uh, speech and his letter um, we're, we're actually chilling the free speech of those who um, were what pro resistance, um, you know that sort of thing. Um, and I, you know, I found the article very disingenuous because they interviewed the advisor for Students for Justice in Palestine, who said, "Well, all we're doing is criticizing the Israeli government." Well, they're doing a lot more than that. And, Absolutely. and you know, the, the reporter didn't know enough uh, to really press her. Um, they're, they're support, they supported, they came out and supported the second intifada before October 7th even happened. And then they're applauding October 7th. If, if you support uh, the intifada, you're supporting terrorism, full stop. The second right, intifada right. is all but the, the, pro the problem, though, from the free speech angle is that they could turn around and, and turn it on us, right, and say that we're supporting genocide, we're supporting apartheid, we're supporting all these violent things that Israel's doing. So we're so their their accusation is that we're the ones supporting violence. They're just resisting that violence. Finally, okay, Adam, what's what's the rhetorical equivalent uh, that Hillel or other campus organizations have used to uh, you know? There's only one sub. So uh, I don't. I don't agree with the with that logic, but it's a logic that could perhaps hold up in litigation. 
but they actually need to find statements or words spoken in public by uh, members of Jewish uh, groups on campus. And I don't think on most, Can the, the, I, don't, I don't know of a single one, I've heard about a few in Canada, but Jewish organizations on campus that are actually activist organizations. Do we have, I mean, you know, pro-Israel activists. Are any of them supporting Israel's response to October 7th? Are any of them actively saying, you know, Israel needs to do this and this and this and not have a ceasefire until, say, a Hamas surrender? Are any of them saying that? I haven't no, they're seen... saying we stand with Israel, you know, things like that. Right. Uh, well, that could be construed as, as a violent rhetoric, I guess, by some logic. Yes, I guess it could be. But, um, you know, it's just, it, the whole atmosphere is different. I mean, you know, I've, I've yet to see, nor will I ever see, um, Hillel and Chabad, um, you know, le leading a demonstration where everybody is screaming um, the same chant again and again and again. I mean, mm -hmm. they have they have vigils, they have emotional support, um, you know, they have uh, discussions where people are sort of trying to figure out, um, you know, the the actual events and where, you know, how did we get here and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're 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 actually taking the kind of approach that you would expect to see um, on a university campus. I you know, and I think one of the things that's been very successful that that we don't really get um, about the um, the pro Hamas demonstrations, and that's just what I'm going to call them, is that they figured it out, man. That uh, that you you just chant the same thing again and again. You make the same five charges again and again and again. Apartheid, genocide, um, settler colonialism. You, you know, you just keep repeating those five things. And for that big mass in the middle, that's uh, you know didn't didn't know what the pogroms were or, or didn't know what happened in 1948. It, it becomes um, rather effective. Uh, you know, I. I, I you know, I, I wouldn't compare them to the Nazis, you know, but um, Goebbels actually did say, you know, you just keep repeating the same thing over and over again until, you know, people understand people understand what you want them to hear. And that and that's been the strategy. I, yeah. I, I actually went to, you know, after after the president said, well, we're not going to allow violence here. The first thing SJP did was have a teach in. Um, we, um, and, and I went <laughs> and I'm pretty sure I was the only Jew there and I'm pretty sure I was the only supporter of Israel there. And I got some quizzical, uh, let's I'll be polite and say quizzical looks. Um, but man, it, it, if you hear them, if you sort of get beyond the signs, you know, and, and sort of uh, go and, and listen to them, the faculty members who egg them on, um, and some of the students themselves, it's pure dogma. You know, it, it's a slideshow where they say, this is what a settler colonial state does, you know, um, rapacious, genocide, erasure, displacement, foreign invaders, those sorts of things. Um, and, you know, and then it just goes from there. And the, 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 the thing I cannot figure out is, um, Man, th these are smart kids, you know, uh, uh, you know, they they major in things like civil engineering and, and stuff like that, which is real world solutions um, to problems. And, and yet, um, you know, they sort of swallowed this post-colonial dogma whole. Um, and, and it is not to be questioned. I mean, this is this is a uh, this is a someone used the word catechism to refer um, to the Holocaust in Israel a couple of years ago. But um, this this is this is really dogmatic stuff. And, uh, yeah. And I, the key thing you said here is, yeah, faculty, faculty advisors and what they're getting in the classroom, too, because I, I, I agree that this post-colonial stuff is complete bullshit, certainly when you apply it to the context of Israel Palestine. I mean, I, I can't say how many times I've seen people tweet the last few days, professors saying that this is a, a genocide enacted by white people against brown people. I mean, th there's absolutely no logic there. You know, I'm a historian. You can't take that stupid model built to understand American society and just drop it on the Middle East and assume that it works. That's not how it works, right? It's American eccentric, it's ahistorical. And it's used as a political tool to marginalize Jews by presenting them as white people. And white people are, by definition, evil, according to the logic of uh, post-colonial studies. 
And uh, again, with advisors, though, I mean, the fact that they're actually there directing students for justice in Palestine, and I know faculty advisors have to be very careful with stuff like this, uh, whether it's for Hillel or Students for Justice in Palestine or any other, uh, any other group, because if they're caught or if what they do seems to be them directly bullying students, they will get in deep trouble for that, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that happened to you know, UNCW a number of years ago, not related to, to this stuff, but um, um, a, a faculty member made the mistake of directly intervening, um, even though they were objecting to something that was utterly abhorrent you know, going on. But mm -hmm. you gotta let the students fight it out. The, the, the faculty advisors, um, they're very smart in how they're approaching this. And I think they're the ones who are brainwashing these students. Uh, a friend of mine who teaches at a university I won't name, but it's one that has been known for having severe problems in the past. Actually, I'll, I'll name the school. It's, it's uh, Evergreen. And um, uh, they told me that, you know, yeah, they had a severe uh, pro-Palestinian activism problem, but a lot of those professors left. And once the professors were gone, the activism stopped. Mm -hmm. So I really think that there are faculty behind the scenes um, at many of these schools who are, who are the ones orchestrating. Um, oh, absolutely. I, I, absolutely. I found that out when watching a teach on, on their Facebook page like five years ago, and I was horrified um, because I, you know, had never seen anything like this. I mean, here were three faculty members who were sitting, you know, like we would, you know, at a long table panel, you know, um, addressing students you know many of whom didn't know any better and they were lured in with you know food and all, all of these sorts of things and um uh boy uh you know it 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 was it was a narrative that you would not recognize you know it, israel declared independence and commenced ethnic cleansing well that leaves out a lot i you know it's um you know that it is this very um is it's very one-sided narrative none of them had ever been um to to israel i mean they had none of them teach israel none of them have published a word um on israel it's not like we have it's not like edward said is showing up and you know well okay this this is just his view but you know this is the stuff he works on these are people who work on nothing of the kind um and they've adopted this as their cause celeb but the but the funny thing is there are two funny things um, not funny, funny, but peculiar. Um, one is the reading list they give to students. These are the books to read. Elon Pape, right? And um, and Norman Finkelstein, yeah. which, which you know, and, and they're very quick to say, and they're both Jews, you know, as if um, you know, see, even some Jews hate Israel. They they kind of play the same role that J Jewish voices for peace, you know kind of place but the other funny thing in this in this particular instance is one of their chief advisors uh just accepted a job at cornell for next year mm -hmm. you know what happened to the guy at cornell he spoke out in favor of hamas and and um was convinced that maybe he should take a year of leave this particular faculty advisor has no been nowhere to be found um mm -hmm. That, so 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 much for principles, even bad ones. You know, it's um... is that the guy that uh, that uh, that sort of retracted what he said or revised what? Yeah, he said? Yeah. yeah. I can't remember his name. It's really know. hard to keep track of, of, yeah. of all these people. Um, I think that one the person in California who basically said start naming Zionists and finding their addresses and going to harass their kids. I think she must have lost her job because her faculty page disappeared uh, mm -hmm. very quickly. She was at one of the UC or the Cal State. De, De Cristo. Yeah, what, what school was she at? I uh, I don't remember. Uh, did you see Davis? It was, it was UC Davis. Davis. Yeah, yeah. The mapping were. project takes on a whole new um significance now, doesn't it? So, yeah, yeah. No, this is a it's a problem. And you know, if you think about SJP, Jews don't have an equivalent organization on campus. That's not Hillel's job. Hillel should not be out there and active, uh, being activists. They're a, a Jewish cultural organization, and Israel is a component of Jewish identity. And the only political position they've taken on all this officially is we won't partner with anyone who officially uh, supports BDS. That's mm -hmm. the only thing that they've done. Otherwise, uh, they, you know, they're not going to throw someone out who says, well, I think, you know, the occupation is wrong or, you know, uh, even if someone says, yeah. I don't think, I think Israel is a racist state. They're not going to kick somebody out of Hillel, you know, for saying that. Yeah. And the flip side of that is 
Do the Palestinians even have cultural organizations on campuses that are the equivalent of Hillel? Because SJP is pure activism, and it seems that everything they do on campus at this point for, for Palestine is activism in nature. There's no celebration of Palestinian culture here. Um, no, um, um, well, they would argue that they celebrate Palestinian culture because they do have events like films and, you know, book talks and stuff like that. And, mm -hmm. oh, um, Nora Eckerot, you know, <laughs> was invited um, once during um, COVID. But, um, you know, there is a there is an Islam on campus group. And, you know, I, I know nothing about them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, but, uh, yeah, it's like it's, it's like you're it's like you say, look, I mean, they 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 come from a certain part of the world and and they um have heard certain things and they've heard these things for you know what um their entire uh what preteen and adult life or something like that um and so they think what they think and uh then then they major in something that's completely unrelated like biology where they're not going to take a lot of classes and so these faculty advisors are are, are really critical, I think, in, in driving this stuff forward. Yeah, no, it's, it's a real problem. I mean, I, I, I'd like to think that they aren't doing it in their classrooms, but we know they are. I mean, we know a lot yeah. of these people who teach post-colonial studies. I mean, they're, they're packaging it in academic jargon, but the bottom line is that they are framing the content of their courses. Mm -hmm. um, fortunately, fewer in history. I mean, history is still somewhat of a respectable discipline, I think, uh, in this day and age. But it's all these, you know, bogus, you know, ethnic studies uh, disciplines like Africana studies and uh, uh, gender studies, all these disciplines that really don't have a, a proper methodology for analyzing, you know, the past. I'll, I'll say one, I'll, you know, the gender, the gender studies program at UF. Um, did not sign off on that thing in May 20. You're frozen for a sec. Um, you, you froze for a sec, and you're still frozen. Norm, can you hear us? You have frozen on us. Don't worry, Adam, I can yes, I can hear you. Okay, yeah, I can edit that out. That's not a big deal. Uh, note the time, though, oh, okay. 648. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, oh, the gender studies didn't sign off on it? No, uh, the gender studies program at UF did not sign off on that statement in, in May or June of uh, 2021 when hundreds of others did. I was going to ask why that was, um, but I, you know, I'm, I, I know some people over there. I'm sure they found something with them. Did any individual member of the faculty sign it? I couldn't. I, I lose track of the petitions. Uh -huh. um, Adam, wasn't that one um, department signing or something? Well, like it was that? both I, a combination. You know, of, I, 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 I have seen numbers. I think it was a combination of individual faculty members and whole departments. Right. Yeah. Okay. Gender studies I, issued I as a discipline or as a, as a program. Uh, they were one of the departments or programs that issued a national or international statement. Uh, I forget if it was individual signatures or if it was departmental. I, I think you're probably right that it was a combination, a combination of both. There were there were what close to 100 statements that were issued that month, and then after they were all issued, Jewish studies decided yeah. to issue one with uh, 250 uh, Jewish studies signatures calling Israel a racist endeavor built on uh, scientific racist principles that came out of the Enlightenment, um, which is you know an utterly unreasonable way to assess um, Israel. Especially in a moment when there actually were people attacking Jews, um, you know, in the streets. And I mean, that really showed me mm -hmm. violence is possible to come from the left. And it's only a matter of time. Yeah. And I think October 7th precipitated um, what's going to be more violence against the Jews um, in the United States, um, driven by what I have no problem calling the woke, you know, Hamas alliance. Um, or using some term, some term like that, because that's what it is. I mean, at the end of the day, it's people who've uh, absorbed all this intersectional social justice, somehow grafting it onto the Palestinians and believing that the Palestinians are the universal victim in the same way that Marxists in the 19th century is all the proletariat as the universal victim. Mm -hmm. so, I want to ask a question, though. Uh, we have a Holocaust expert here, wife too, but. Uh, Dr. Goda, uh, he's a real expert. He's he's written real books. Expert. Yeah. yeah. Uh, wh where else do we see the the far left uh, playing the game of victim blaming, like we do with uh, this particular scenario or, or Israel in general? 
look, I, you know, um, you, you can go through all of the UN uh, uh, um, statements that have come out of the Human Rights Committee and how most of them target Israel, but they don't target Iran, they don't target China, they don't target Syria, they don't target Russia. Well, Russia's on the Security Council, of course, and China's. But, um, you know, it's, it, it's, a, it's an extreme vilification. And I, um, you, you know, I think, I, you know, my preference is to, um, uh, you know, sort of, sort of take this back a little bit and um, try and figure out, as a couple of historians are, when did anti-Semitism uh, morph into anti-Zionism? Uh, you know, anti-Zionism sort of being a fig leaf um, for the former. And um, you, you know, it's really, it's really fascinating stuff. I mean, um, guys like Jeffrey Herfer working on it, and guys like Matthias Kunzel in in Germany. Um, are working on it. Um, but of course, anti-Semitism um, as something you wore on your sleeve uh, became unacceptable under the Nazis. And so a new terminology was needed. And, um, you know, I, I edited this book once um, having to do with uh, an Anglo-American committee that was going all over the world, um, you know, the US, Britain, the European continent, and then all over the Middle East, um, hearing opinions on Jewish refugees going to Palestine after World War II. And the um, the Arab delegation, whether it was the head of the Arab delegations, you know, whether it was the head of the Arab League, whether it was, um, you know, uh, Arab scholars like uh, Albert Rani, or, you know, whether it was, um, um, you know, dignitaries in Baghdad or Riyadh or wherever, they, they kept making this argument again and again, we're not anti-Semites, we're anti-colonial, um, this is uh, colonization, and we're anti-Zionist, and, and they began using that language then. Um, and, you know, I mean, Jeffrey Herf is coming out with a book later, you know, where he argues that all of this became legitimized when the Soviet bloc took up anti-Zionism, because, you know, now you, now you have this major world movement that, that didn't just lose a war, you know, but, you know, it kind of considered itself the spokesman um, sort of for the global left. And there was a very interesting moment um, when uh, the Zionism uh, is a form of racism resolution was passed at the UN in, in 1975. It's very interesting to go back and look at what the US ambassador to the UN, Daniel Moynihan said. He said, if, if you twist um, the meaning of racism and if you twist the meaning of human rights, so that these things uh, are are now used as you know fig leaves for anti-Semitism. You drain those terms of meaning, and he said this in 1975. And and here again, you know, um, we're we're seeing the fruit from the poison tree, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, when you hear that we're we're supporting human rights, but you 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 just can't be bothered um, mm -hmm. with, with the slaughters that took place on October 7th. Why can't you just say, you know, we we find this horrible and we don't support Hamas and we think Hamas should step down, and but we still believe um, you know, in, in some sort of a two-state solution or dignity for Palestinians. They can't bring themselves to do They'll that. They'll never say two-state solution because 1948 yeah. is yeah. a racist endeavor, which which yeah. rules out a two-state solution. I mean, the one that Jewish studies, that second elephant in the room statement, um, the first paragraph is great. You know, it can, and we did a whole podcast on it. It condemns Hamas and actually says that Israel has the right to pursue them wherever they may be. I mean, mm -hmm. it's terrific. But then every other paragraph that followed is about Israel needs to call an immediate ceasefire. Uh, you know, all prisoners in Palestinian jails need to be exchanged for uh, every Israeli hostage. Um, Israel should stop bombing Gaza. I mean, it, it completely negates what they said in the first paragraph. And I, I think they did that to dupe people into signing their statements because, you know, people read quickly. They probably just read the first paragraph. And also it gives them, you know, cover. It gives them their plausible deniability. What are you talking but, about? You know, it, it just yeah. astounds me that, you know, the, the, the brutality of the atrocities committed against innocence on October 7th. And so many people on the left shrug it off as if their only response is, well, they had it coming. Like, when else do we see that and in a way, I think that they're 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 participating in the terrorism by not uh, calling it out and by using it as an opportunity 
to uh, point at, at the Jewish state and say, the Jewish state is evil. See, this is resistance against the, the evils of the Jewish state. Uh, you know, that's, that's what Hamas wants when they do this. They want, you know, worldwide support. And by uh, giving it to them, we're just giving Hamas what they want. It, it participates in that brutality just by supporting it and by uh, shifting it, uh, the, bl the, the blame over to the victim. And I just don't see any other scenario uh, in, in any other uh, 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 political situation or social situation where the left would tolerate this kind of victim blaming. Oh, the left wouldn't tolerate it anywhere. I mean, anywhere. If, you look, if you look at any ethnic conflict, you know, every party to the, to the conflicts play the victim, right? But it doesn't really go beyond that. You know, Russia's done a very good job at playing the victim with the war in the Ukraine, even mm -hmm. Putin's inaugural speech. There were enough little snippets of truth in there um, to make it somewhat plausible. And yeah, these Bolsheviks created arbitrary, you know, boundaries um, and, and for uh, the created future states, proto-states that really didn't have a basis of statehood in history. But everything else he said in there was an outright lie, and he used that to um, to invade Ukraine. So every every ethnic group uh, has their grievances. I mean, you know, uh, Peter Novik said it in the Holocaust in American Life, the uh, Victimhood Olympics, right? But it's only with Israel where the entire world, you know, gangs up on Israel and says, yes, they are the aggressor. And uh, and the Palestinians are the victim. Even it's when crazy. even when even when Israelis are killed and beheaded and raped and have their throats uh, cut and babies are burned in ovens, even when that happens to Israelis, to innocent yeah. Israelis, they still blame the victim. Yeah, and the best you'll get is we condemn Hamas, comma. However, and that's the best you get. Never yeah. Hamas is evil, brutal, full stop. Yeah. And they have nothing to do with the Palestinians. That's also their line. You know, they're a brutal regime oppressing the Palestinians, which, of course, is true. Um, but they were elected at one point. And I think if Hamas has a problem, uh, I think if the Palestinians have a problem with Hamas today, it has very little to do with their actual Jewish policy. Uh, it probably has more to do with how they are suffering um, in their daily lives under Hamas. So, no, it's a big problem. And, you know, that brings us back to, to some of these statements here. The way I see it is there's a you know, I think there's like four levels or four spaces where these statements have been emanating from, and uh, it varies from university to university. Uh, and, you know, the post uh, October 7th is a great example. You have administrators who have issued some statements. Some have been great. Some have not been so great. Some of them have been, you know, immediate. Some of them have been a response to things that have happened on their campus when it's ceased to be a problem you know, far off uh, elsewhere. I can understand an administrator not wanting to issue a statement if their campus is completely quiet. I mean, you know, why get involved in, in foreign events, especially if we have a small Jewish and a small Arab population on our campus, maybe we should just, you know, leave it at that. Um, then there's the statements being issued by uh, faculty, be it uh, entire uh, uh, fields or disciplines, like the one from sociology um, recently, or, you know, confined to a specific school, like, you know, Cooney Law School and, and these other law schools that love issuing, or the one from Columbia the other day, right? Mm -hmm. um, then you have student organizations that are issuing um, their statements and signing off on stuff, which is abhorrent and has elicited a response in some cases, like at Harvard, right? Harvard, uh, faculty at Harvard issued a great later letter as a response to those 35 clubs which didn't even consult their members um, in many cases when they issued their condemnatory statement. And then finally, and here's where we get into, you know, our whole, you know, reason for having created the network, you have Jewish studies response, right? And the problem here is even after October 7th, Jewish studies remain silent. Even after incidents break out on campuses. I mean, after what happened to Cornell last night, you know, Jewish studies at Cornell, as far as I'm concerned, has an obligation to condemn us, but they won't, right? And Norm, your your program um, is one of the few programs that issued a, an actual condemnatory statement with no buts and no howevers immediately after October 7th. And I'm, I'm going to read it right now because this is really a model, a short model statement that I think every Jewish studies program in the country should issue. A message from the Shorstein Center on the violence in Israel. The Bud Shorstein Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Florida expresses its horror and grief in response to Hamas's reprehensible and indefensible violence against civilians in Israel from the very young to the very old. To all those affected by this terror, including our students, family, members, and friends, we offer our steadfast support. 
We pray that the memory of those lost will be a blessing to their loved ones for the physical and emotional recovery of the thousands of the wounded and for the safe return to their homes of those abducted into Gaza. After the Holocaust, the world voiced the phrase never again many times. It also made extensive efforts to teach future generations about the dangers of anti-Semitism, blind hatred, and political fanaticism. The world must reflect on how, in our own day, premeditated crimes based on all three have occurred. You know, it, it's perfectly worded. There's not, not even a hint of all lives matter in there whatsoever. There's no buts. There's no howevers. Uh, you know, there's no, but we need a ceasefire because of the innocent victims in Gaza. And don't get me wrong, I don't want to see civilians killed in Gaza. But really, you know, the day after October 7th, before Israel even launches any sort of ground invasion to start screaming genocide in Gaza, genocide in Gaza, it's, it's absurd. And I don't know of another Jewish studies program in uh, the country. I can't think of a single one that has, or I haven't seen a single one um, issue a statement that even comes close to this. Very few programs have issued statements. And the one that Chapel Hill issued was really one of the most abhorrent things I've ever seen. And I pushed back on it. And they issued a better statement, far from perfect, but at least they actually condemned Hamas, which apparently was too much for them the first time around. So what do we do about this? You know, I, is it just luck that we have a Jewish studies program in Florida um, where there are people and the director who are sympathetic. Um, By the way, you know, uh, that day that this happened, uh, like the word October 8th, the next day, you and I said, you know, we can write the script, right? We know all of these statements are going to be coming out. Yeah. You know? So we, it's all, pre it was all predictable. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I said we should hold off a few days because before, you know, doing a podcast on it because it's only, or issuing a statement because it's only going to get worse. Mm -hmm. And it is getting worse. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. the whole the whole thing here is, you know, and especially, you know, again, I do think Jewish studies should have all issued a statement immediately afterwards. But once, you know, altercations break out on campus, um, even if, you know, people are shouting back and forth, as soon as there are Jewish students who are feeling intimidated and triggered and traumatized, uh, Jewish studies has an obligation to step in and say something, you know, just as any other ethnic studies program would. Latino studies would, would, sorry, Latinx studies would certainly step in and say something if there were, you know, white supremacists marching on campus, you know, chanting, you know, deport Latinos or whatever, right? So the Latino studies program would say something and they would offer a safe space for their Latino students. But Jewish studies can't do that. Um, and more often than not, they go with the other side. Um, it's, it's the, I can't think of any other ethnic community in the world that does this, right? Well, you've, uh, you, you've written yourself, um in places that, you know, we've all tried to puzzle with this. Is it, um, is it a genuinely different view of events in the conflict? Is it an effort to sort of be with the cool kids um, on, on the other side of the lunchroom? Um, is it, you know, is it, um, you know, fear-based, you know, we, uh, this is something I would like someone to do research on because it it really doesn't make any sense, and it would be a it would be a nice project um, mm -hmm. for for a kid working in yeah I don't know. Um, you have to get inside the minds of the faculty. Do, right? I mean, you have to Jared, find do, do we know Do we know a psychoanalyst who can look into this? <laughs> Well, there's I will a say this about our, hair on fire to you. He could he could psychoanalyze it. I, I, I will say this about our statement. Um, I'm very proud of that statement, and and we all are. And so I, I I'm I'm very appreciative of the fact that that you guys like it. But it it took it, it looks like a simple statement. It it took us a couple days to hammer it out. We all had the same, you know, I, I, I wrote this with, with our um, advisory committee. We have a, we have a three person advisory committee. I don't want to um, put their names out there, but you know, anything of importance, I, you know, we sort of do it together. And, uh, and then in this case, we presented it to um, the center faculty as a whole. And it, it took us, um, we, the, the sentiment was always there, finding the right words, and I'm still not sure if they were the right words, was always a little difficult. But, you know, we just thought we'd rather be 
you know, 48 hours later or something like that and get it right than, than rush into something and then, you know, regret a word here and there. So, you know, we batted it back and forth a lot. And, um, you know, we- And then you spoke to the other faculty in your program, right? You, you yes, know. yes. I mean, we we showed it to everybody and, um, you, you know, there were, you know, most people said, yeah, this is, this is perfectly, um, perfectly good. I mean, there were a couple of- um, you know, stylistic things. I, you know, somebody should have said, said, well, just have the first line and just say there are no words. But by that time, so many people had said there are no words, you know, and um, we wanted to come up with something that was, that was us and that was Jewish, you know, um, you know, may their memories be a blessing is, is, is a very Jewish thing. Were these all faculty members or were any of them community uh, members? Of no, it's just faculty. It was just yeah, which is the way it should be. A program speaking in, on behalf of a program and the, the faculty should have a voice and, and you know, consult it, which is what, you know, we did in my department when we issued a, a BLM statement in June 2020. We got together and we discussed uh, the language mm -hmm. very carefully. But Chapel Hill statements, according to at least two faculty members I've spoken to, um, apparently the director just wrote that, didn't consult anyone else on the faculty or at least the faculty that I've spoken to. And uh, you know, if the program did that in my name, I would be out there, I would be considered disaffiliating myself from that program. And you know, those people have home departments. They don't have to be affiliated with Jewish studies. Much as Oren Gross did in 2021, uh, the law professor at uh, Minnesota, is it Minnesota where he's at? Um, do you know? Yeah. yeah. Do you know Oren Gross? No, I don't. He's a law <laughs> professor in Minnesota and uh, he is affiliated with Jewish studies because he teaches courses on Israeli uh, law. And um, he was so outraged by the response um, that uh, Jewish studies in the university you know, had towards uh, the events in Gaza that he said, okay, well, you know what? I'm just not going to be affiliated with Jewish studies anymore. I'm a law professor. I could go teach whatever I want involving the law and research whatever I want. I don't need this in my life. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some people have the luxury, you know, of doing stuff like that. But I, I do think that a big part of it is, yes, wanting to be part of the cool kids, as, as David Hirsch wrote. The ticket of admission to social justice circles is signing off on anti-Zionism. And I think Jewish studies has this partially this inferiority complex, um, which I think goes back to the very origins of Jewish studies in the 19th century. I think they've always had a sort of inferiority complex. Coupled with the fact that they think that, oh, if we're not, if we don't behave as the Goys want us to behave, then there's going to be anti-Semitism. So if they think anti-Zionism, you know, is, is the party line and yeah, we're not happy about what's going on in the Middle East anyway. And, uh, you know, we're better off just going along with it. I, I think that's a big part of it. I think a lot of it, and uh, I don't know how much of this applies to actual Jews, but it certainly applies to the non-Jews, um, you know, involved in all this, is that there is this genuine fear and contempt of the very idea of Jews exercising power. And I think this is just the combination of 2,000 years of the Jews as a people in exile, and, you know, from, the, you know, the Christian point of view, and going all the way up to the Nazis, I mean, the very idea of Jewish power of Jews exercising power is something that is pernicious and unacceptable. The, the Jews are identified by their victim status, right? And and we are not Jewish unless we're victims. So having power is the antithesis to that. Yeah, except we're not accorded victimization here in the Israeli conflict. So there's a bit of a, a contradiction there. But I mean, for the Christian church, we had to be powerless. We were supposed to have disappeared with the advent of Christianity, and we didn't. And Jewish self-definition, too, played into this because the Jews said, we are a people in exile. We have sinned. We are going to remain and we're not going to fight back and we won't use violence to create a Jewish state until the Messiah comes. I mean, that was Jewish theology for 2,000 years. That's why the ultra-Orthodox rejected um, Zionism um, right out of the gate. So I think that I think there are people who still fear that today. And I think that's I think that affects the Jewish psyche. They don't like the idea of Jews exercising power in the name of anything Jewish, which is why they're obsessed with using the term Jewish supremacy. Yeah, it, it could be that. Uh, it, it could be the whole whiteness thing. Um, you know, but I, you know, what you just said made me think back to um documents I read, diplomatic documents I read. Um you know, from the years of Israel's birth, 1948, 1949. And that's the thing that... You're freezing up. Um, 
um, mm. was here you had guys like uh, Moshe Sharet and, and, and Ben Gurion who, you know, had sort of come as, or, and even Weizmann, you know, had sort of come as supplicants um, before. Now they were saying no, you know, uh, no, we're we we're not going to um, we're not going to uh, have the Negev severed and divided between Jordan and Egypt, you know, so that they'll they'll feel a little bit less bad, you know. No, we're not going to have Haifa um, put under some kind of international rule. No, uh, you know, we know it's awful for the refugees. But we simply cannot let them back. I mean, we we just got attacked. Um, we see them as security risks, and and the Arab states can handle them. Um, that 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 repeated no. You know, these are the things we'll do. These are the things we just won't. Um, I I think just drove the international community to distraction in forty eight and forty nine because they'd never seen it. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and uh, yeah, uh, you know, this is sort of the beginning the of the international problem in a sense yeah and, although and, you know, i wouldn't put ben, ben i wouldn't put netanyahu in ben gurion's class uh, mm -hmm. or anything like that i don't think he even ought to ought to be in the same uh you know zip code in terms of um great leaders but you know yeah and i think the american jewry uh, segments of american jewry especially the academics ac academics or people in jewish studies don't like the idea of jews exercising power and mm -hmm. you know, the irony here is that the Jews, I would argue that in terms of being a minority, the Jews, you know, the left celebrates it whenever any other, you know, quote, colonized people uses uh, violence, you know, without, well, then again, they are justifying Hamas terrorism. Anyway, in any case, uses violence to liberate itself. I mean, you know, they all read Franz Fanon, and this is their Bible for the right of, of people to go and, you know, decapitate babies and whatnot. But the Jews are a colonized people in the same way as these other people have been colonized. They just happen to have resided on the European continent, um, where they were severely persecuted for 2,000 years. But it is it was a form of colonization of sorts. And uh, no. go ahead. Oh, no, I uh, go ahead, Adam. Right. I was just going to say that uh, I'm not a psychoanalyst like our friend is, um, but uh, I, I think that to some extent there's some Stockholm syndrome going on here as well. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? Uh, well, I'm not a psychoanalyst. <laughs> Elaborate on it uh, because they're... Well, I mean, to to a great degree, it's it's uh, an identify they're identifying with uh, the persecutors and oppressors of the Jewish people in some way or seeing uh, some value, a great degree of value in their point of view. Yeah, yeah, and there's also, I mean, you wanna look at it in terms of the inquisition, it's repentance. It's repentance for the sin of Israel. It's purging my soul of ever having even, you know, thought to have supported the idea of Jews, you know, exercising power. And uh, I mean, that's the same thing that happened in the Soviet Union under, under terror when people, uh, you know, were expected to repent for possibly having supported Menshevism at one point. I think there's a lot of that going on going on as well. Um, you know what the other side of that coin is, is, is this um, is this resentment of the Holocaust uh, within post-colonial studies? Yeah. You know, I've seen it again and again, and, uh, you know, we began to see it in the 1960s, and I'm studying a guy who, but, but you mentioned Fanon, you know, well, uh, the Holocaust was just a family um, argument. Someone ought to write this book from Fanon to Whoopi Goldberg, you know, yeah. <laughs> but but it's almost a, like you people didn't deserve um, this atrocity, not not like you didn't deserve it, like you don't deserve to, to claim it somehow. I was at a Lessons and Legacies conference uh, not long ago, and I, I was sitting and listening to a panel, and when they got to the questions, um, someone actually said, the Holocaust is a hegemonic narrative. Mm -hmm. Really? Really? Mm -hmm. The Holocaust is a hegemonic narrative. The, this field that really isn't that old, um, which is still really undiscovered country, you know, um, if, if you start looking um, in, in um, uh, East Galicia, like one of my colleagues is, or Romania, or, you know, um, so much of Eastern um, Europe, it is a hegemonic narrative that somehow crowds everything out. Well, it never did crowd everything out. Everybody can work on on what they want to. I mean, this isn't really a scorekeeping question. Um, it's uh, it's simply understanding the nature 
of different atrocities, but there's this resentment of it. You know, I can't quite put my finger on it, but I can feel it. Um, yeah. Where else would they say that? Like, would they ever say that American slavery is used as that kind of narrative for a hegem What was the term? Hegemonic what? Narrative. Narrative. Would they ever say that American slavery is a hegemonic narrative? No, only white supremacists would say something like that. Right. And they don't have the they don't have the syllabic ability to say that entire <laughs> phrase, um, but no, th that's one hundred percent correct. I mean, the Holocaust is, is quote white on white crime, and of course, the other aspect of that is that they blame Israel of exploiting uh, Holocaust trauma mm -hmm. in order to justify everything it's, do it's done, even its right to exist, which is absurd because we all know Zionism began well before the Holocaust, right? It was a response to the pogroms. Um, but it was also an awakening because nationalism emerged on the European continent uh, during that period, and uh, the Jews developed their you know, national identity. All the anti-Semites were saying, go back to your homeland in Palestine. So uh, once they started killing him in, in Russia, they said, you know what, maybe we should do that. So obviously anti-Semitism is a core element of what uh, sparked Zionism, but it's not, I mean, just to say that this is about exploiting the Holocaust is absurd. Yeah. Right. There, there's no foundation for that. Not that Israel doesn't exploit Holocaust memory, but every group that's experienced some sort of trauma um, in their history does that. I mean, that's how you construct collective memory. Right. Every group does that. So, you know, obviously Israel's going to do it. Why wouldn't they? Right. Armenian nationalists do it. Palestinians do it. Right. I mean, their entire foundation of, the, uh, of, of their national cause is rooted in the Nakba. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's their, uh, you know, myth of origin is, uh, you know, scholars of nationalism would like to call it not myth in the sense that it didn't happen, but myth in the sense that it's, you know, it's a combination of history and collective memory that's taken on this, you know, monolithic narrative form. And, and well, the, the other, look at the, sorry, sorry. Adam. The narrative for Jews is never again. Right. And I don't think that that. Israel exploits it uh, to nearly to the same extent that they're accused of. Is Israel, in many ways, is a testament to Jews getting beyond the Holocaust, right, and building a state, a successful state, uh, and and making something of themselves, right. Uh, where they do invoke the Holocaust is yeah. in that that never again mantra to say that we still have enemies and we can't just. Uh, be naive about that. We need to defend ourselves and protect ourselves from destruction because we're always going to have them. That's why Jews look at back to the Holocaust because there are still anti-Semites running around now and there always will be. And Israel's needed to safeguard uh, the lives of Jews in a world that has a lot of people that want to oppress us. Yeah, absolutely. Well, even, we even if early... Oh, sorry. No, I just want to say, even in the in the very early history of Israel, um, th there was sort of a a determination to put the Holocaust over there, you know, and certainly not put it front and center. Um, not only in the way that um, European refugees were seen, yeah, you know, uh, as sort of the people who got it wrong, you know, and and um, you, you know the things people said about them, you know, the whole lambs to the slaughter stuff and all of that, but also just it. It wasn't part of Ben Gurion's uh, rationale for the state. It, yeah. His rationale for the state is we're not here because of the Balfour Declaration. We're not here because of the 1922 mandate. We're here because we've always been here, you know. And and he he didn't really invoke the Holocaust. And and of course, um, when Eichmann was uh, discovered in uh, Argentina and when they got that tip, he he was really much more interested in in. Um, in the vulnerability on the borders, you know, than, than he was with this. I mean, it worked out the way that it worked out. And I would argue that that was, you know, I mean, anybody would argue that this was a pivotal moment for, for Holocaust memory and catharsis and, and all of those sorts of things. But even then, um, it, it was more of a cathartic moment um, for survivors uh, than it, what, did Israel go and attack somebody in 1962 saying, eh, the, the Holocaust? No, it's, uh, it, you know, it, it, it just wasn't. Hunt down, it did it hunt down, down, it did uh, hunt down. It did hunt yeah, down. Of course, of course it yes. Did. 
And there obviously is an element. I mean, Ben Gurion did give a speech where he said, you know, today the Jews are acting as the judges uh, against their mm -hmm. against their persecutors and because Nuremberg was very unsatisfying um, in, yeah. in that regard. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, obviously, how the Holocaust is going to figure into you know Jewish uh, into Israeli collective memory and um, and Jewish collective memory, you know, abroad. I mean, Peter Novick goes way too far in arguing that it's the foundation of, of Jewish identity in the United States. It's a big element of it, but it's not the only thing. According to the polls, though, it is. Like, that's the number one thing that Jews identify with. Yeah. If you look at the Pew poll. Well, really, so really oh, I thought, sorry, I thought you meant the Polish people. Okay, sorry, the Pew polls. Um, yeah, no, I, I guess it is true. It is true to a certain extent. And uh, you will find more, you will find more Jews in the United States identifying with the Holocaust than with Israel. I mean, that, I think that is certainly the case. Uh, I mean, to identify with Israel, you will have had to have had some sort of Zionist education uh, growing up, and not all Jews, you know, have gotten that. But the Holocaust, yeah, I mean, even if your family came here after the pogroms, the Holocaust is seen by them as a continuation of what started that, right? Mm -hmm. That was uh, anti-Semitism, whether they want to see it in any sophisticated light of medieval versus modern or whatever, from their perspective, they were trying to kill us then, and look what ended up happening uh, 70 years later. We are, um, I think, at the hour mark, um, probably a few minutes uh, beyond. Uh, but this has been. I'll just say one more thing, if you'll let me. Yeah, please go ahead. Because this, this came from one of my colleagues. He he said uh, after October seventh, he said, "You know, Dara Horn's uh, line: people love dead Jews." It's not true. They don't like us even when we're dead. Yeah. Yeah, they don't like us. Period. There's a good book to write in there. People don't love dead Jews. We're living. Yeah. Jews. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, this has been another uh, terrific um, episode. And uh, we have a very sophisticated scholar of Jewish studies here who's written some great books um, on Nazism and kind the Holocaust, of um, including a textbook that I still haven't read, but I have it sitting on my shelf. <laughs> I'm just so used to assigning. I don't think anyone else has either. It's okay. <laughs> But um, so we're going to sign off now. And uh, thank you very much to Professor Norman Goda, um, the University of Florida, uh, who's not only a great scholar, but a true warrior um, in the battle that we were waging for the right to identify um, as Jews with the state. Um, and that's it for tonight. So thank you very much. Thanks, guys, both of you for having me. And thanks you for doing uh, the work that you do.